Hello and welcome to The Consistency Project with E.C. Sinkowski. My name is Patrick Cummings. In every episode, I have the distinct privilege of presenting E.C. with a question on subject matters that range from nutrition to fitness to the choices we can all make to live a healthier, more functional life. By exploring both the principles at play and the actions worth carrying out as a result, we aim to get you thinking, get you moving, and get you taking more consistent steps toward optimizing your well-being. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. How are you, E.C.? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thank you. We're going to dive into a conversation, a question that first came to us with the idea of maybe doing a quick bite. One of the quick bite is when we sort of put your feet to the fire and make you answer a question in five minutes. But as you were thinking about it, as you dove into it, you realize maybe there's more here. So we're going to have a conversation about the relationship between sodium and hypertension and talk about heart disease and salt and all these things, and electrolytes. Before we do, we want to let people or we want to remind people because we've been talking about it the last couple episodes about your new membership site, your new membership option for folks. Give people a sense of what that is and, and who it might be for. Yeah, it's at members.optimizemenutrition.com. And there's going to be additional bonus content largely featured around the podcast topics. Mm. So typically that's been going out in my emails. So that will now transition to subscription content. We'll also have an additional live Q&A. So those tend to be the popular episodes. So yep. we'll have an additional one for those subscribers. And I think I'll also add just some some other stuff, like what I'm reading either in mainstream literature or in the scientific literature, some small pieces like that. But I do want it to kind of evolve with what the community wants and finds valuable. So I I imagine that in a year from now, it won't look exactly the same. Mm. And yeah, just for the people that love learning about nutrition and want to know more. Yeah, I mean, that's what what it's going to be. Awesome. Cool. So you said members.optimizedmenutrition.com and you do have kind of introductory coupon code out there. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. And that'll be going for a little bit longer. We started almost a month ago. So. Yep. Excellent. Cool. All right. So this conversation about sodium hypertension, the original question, and I'll just read it because I've got it in front of me. The original question was from Anne. Could you talk about salt? Should we be limiting it? How much is too much? Since cutting out sugar, I'm probably using more salt in my cooking for flavor and would love to understand more about how much is too much and why. So where's the, where's the best place to dive into that question or into this idea? Yeah, we had talked a little bit about high blood pressure actually in relation to weight loss. And that was in quick bites number two. And I mentioned how blood pressure and weight gain is related. And, and then, so then combined after I gotten this question from Anne as well, I just felt like I wanted to tackle kind of blood pressure, hypertension, and then salt intake more in depth. And and I really liked the last part of her question, you know, how much is too much and why, right? Because I feel like, you know, people understand that salt is related to blood pressure, but maybe the details not so much and and why we should care about it and how to kind of monitor in the diet. So we are going to get to Anne's question about exactly how much sodium intake, but I think we need a little bit background kind of primer first. Which is why we have to do a whole episode on it and not just a five minute answer, right? I can't do it in five minutes. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I think maybe the best place to start is a sense of maybe even just what blood pressure is or or why it matters in this conversation. Totally. Yeah. So pressure is kind of the force applied per unit area. So when we're talking about blood pressure, we're talking about the pressure of the blood on the arteries. And again, the arteries are the vessels that carry blood away from the heart. So we're talking about how much physical pressure the blood is pushing on the walls of a blood vessel and it's measured in millimeters of mercury and it's a ratio of the pressure on the arteries when the heart beats over the pressure on the arteries between heartbeats. So it should be a higher pressure Mm. over a lower pressure or it's the systolic pressure is what it's called over the diastolic pressure and the normal numbers are considered 120 over 80. And then hypertension or high blood pressure is when it's higher than that. And it's typically when it's higher than 130 over 80. And there's different stages of hypertension depending on how much higher you go than that. Mm -hmm. Here's a simple question. Why does it matter? Why do we care about that? Totally. Yeah. I mean, blood pressure affects a few different things, one of which is your heart. So your heart has to create that pressure to move the blood through the body and it's through its muscle muscle contraction. And there's generally a few reasons why the pressure has to increase, why that contraction pressure has to increase. And we're going to look at a couple. One is how much blood the heart has to pump. And the second is how much resistance it faces. Now, how much resistance it faces is going to be the more influential factor of those two, because there really isn't this limitless space for blood volume to expand. So how much blood there is to pump isn't going to change that 
much for most people in most circumstances. But when that does change, when there's a greater volume of fluid, that's going to require a greater pressure, right? More, more pressure to move more fluid. Mm -hmm. But the other one, that resistance is going to be a big factor because pumping fluid through smaller channels requires greater pressure. And we mentioned yep. that in that quick bites episode. Now, why is that the case? Because there's more fluid in the direct contact with the vessel wall. So there's more fluid dragging along, getting resistance when it's dragging along the walls. And so that's why we need more pressure. And this is one of the very fast ways that your body changes blood pressure. It's through vasoconstriction or blood vessel constriction and vasodilation or just dilation of the blood vessels. And it's like, I'm sure you've had it when you get really nervous very fast and your blood pressure shoots up and your heart starts mm -hmm. racing. That's because your body is changing how small or large those, those channels are. Now, I think this gets confusing because heart disease has so many different manifestations. Yeah. You hear all these words and terms like heart attack, stroke, heart failure, coronary artery disease. I mean, we can keep going. And so it's trying to understand, oh, my gosh, what are all the differences between those two and why the heck are they related to blood pressure? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to try to make all of that simple, you know, with heart disease, cardiovascular disease, all of its different manifestations, the pump, the heart and the channels, the vessels, they're just not working throughout the body, right? And then that, that can happen in many different ways. So remember, the heart is pumping blood. We need that blood to get to all the tissues because it's carrying oxygen that helps us create energy, and it's also carrying nutrients that we need to create that energy. So that's what's helping keep the cells alive. So if the heart can't create enough pressure to drive the blood, as would happen in, let's say, heart failure, not good, right? That's one of the pro potential problems. Mm -hmm. Another is one of the channels can get blocked, not good. That's where we have heart attack or stroke. You know, the tissues aren't getting the nutrients or oxygen, so they're going to die. There's going to be damage there. So again, if, if pressure, pressure can increase because there's more fluid to pump and or the channels are getting smaller and that pressure might be too great for the heart to keep up or the channels just might become blocked. And so high blood pressure has often been called kind of the silent killer because you don't really feel that this is happening, right? Like you don't feel the increase in the arteries, yeah. right? You don't feel that as an increase in pressure in your arm. So you don't necessarily have this, all of this pain before the heart attack happens. Our, our best red flag is the fact that you have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so you, you mentioned kind of two ways that, that that blood pressure increases, right? You said the channel narrows and or there's an increase in blood volume. Correct. Where does diet come into this? Where does nutrition come into this? Where, where eventually we're going to get into this idea of salt and sodium? Totally. Totally. Yeah. We got to start linking those to diet. So yep. we're going to start with channel narrowing. And again, we actually mentioned this in the quick bite episode, but this is the process of atherosclerosis, or as you've heard probably in the mainstream media a lot, like the artery clogging plaques, yeah. right? Yep. Now this, I think we're going to have to do a podcast on this just in its own right, but we've mentioned before that fat and cholesterol travel together in the body. And so mm -hmm. what happens for these artery clogging plaques is that these cholesterol molecules carrying fat can end up building up in your blood vessel walls, in your arteries. And again, that exact mechanism of how that happens requires mm -hmm. more than we can do right now. But basically, when you have higher cholesterol, when you have more of these molecules around, you're more at risk for that happening. Why? There's just more in the system, so the chances of it getting stuck and staying there are higher. Now, because they are getting stuck in the walls, guess what's happening to the diameter of that blood vessel channel, mm -hmm. right? It is narrowing, and therefore mm -hmm. we need greater pressure to drive the fluid through a smaller channel. And this, of course, the, the, the channel itself can also just become fully blocked, and this is where we would have the heart attack or the stroke. Again, that blood isn't getting to the tissues with oxygen and nutrients to create energy, therefore the tissues die. This is how you might have brain damage after a stroke that or loss of function after a, a stroke. Mm -hmm. So that's one is, is the cholesterol and fat is going to be related to the narrowing of the cha channels. But now we're on to Anne's question. Finally, you know, why would blood volume increase? And that would potentially be because of your salt intake. Mm. So when you eat a lot of salt, the concentration of salt in your blood increases. No surprise. Now, physiologists are certainly going to cringe at my explanation at this. I'm using kind of a crude definition of this. Forgive me, but generally the concentration of salt has to stay within a narrow range. And so to keep that salt in a narrow range, we have to either get rid of the excess salt or we increase the amount of water in the system, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you were to add water to a concentrated solution, it becomes more dilute. And so the body can do both. 
<laughs> the kidney will retain water and it will excrete salt. So now we can have additional water in the system to keep the concentration in range, but guess what? That's extra volume of fluid to pump, so blood pressure increases. And we generally see this relationship that as salt increases in the diet, blood pressure generally increases as well. Mm. So with our diets, we can narrow the channels through those plaques and they're carrying cholesterol and fat, or we can increase the volume of fluid to pump by eating too much salt. In both cases, blood pressure goes up. And guess what? When we look at the foods that we tend to overeat that are high in fat, maybe cholesterol and salt, we can see why high blood pressure is a problem everywhere. So to Anne's question, maybe a little bit more specifically, is there a level of intake, a level of salt intake that we should have, that we shouldn't have, that we should be worried about? Like, how do we actually start taking everything you just said and saying, okay, well, now what? What do we actually yeah. do with that? Let's actually have some useful information, right? <laughs> usable. <laughs> I should say usable, not useful, but usable, right? <laughs> yeah, so we first have to understand just kind of the terminology of salt. Salt is a compound molecule. It's actually the elements of sodium and chloride stuck together. That's what table salt is. Mm. So when you hear recommendations about sodium, that's kind of half, if you will, of the molecule. It turns out the recommendations for sodium about 40% of the weight of the salt that comes out of your shaker. There isn't really a recommendation of salt. It's actually a recommendation on sodium. Of is that, is that what you Sodium, mean? yeah. And then we, we're going to convert it to an amount of salt. But typically what you're going to see from the USDA, which has been pretty consistent over the years, is how much sodium to have every day. And, and what they say is 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day, which ends up being about six grams if you were to measure it from your salt shaker. Now, some organizations actually recommend less than 2,300 milligrams per day. I've seen even down to 1,500 milligrams a day, because I think essential sodium is around 500 milligrams a day, meaning how much you would really need from your diet. Now, before we worry about whether or not we should be at 2,300 or the 1,500, we have to remember where we actually are, and Americans on average are well above that. Americans on average are having 3,400 milligrams a day. So mm -hmm. I'm not super worried about making the standard lower before we first hit the you know, the middle of the road <laughs> standard, right? right. So 2,300 milligrams per day is kind of a good place to start. Now, here's really maybe the, the kicker of the whole podcast. According to the Center for Science in the Public Interest, 80%, 80% of the sodium in American diets comes from processed food and foods from restaurants. Mm. 80%. 10% yeah. is from your home cooking, and 10% is naturally occurring in foods. Okay, mm. so if we want to look at where to reduce sodium intake, <laughs> yeah, I think I'm we should all stop start, cooking. Yeah, I'm not going to start Clearly. with like, you know, the soup I made at home, right? Like, yeah. it's the processed foods. It's when we go out to eat that are very, very high in sodium. And so I would look at anything that comes in a box, a bag, a jar, and it lists the amount of sodium per serving in milligrams. And it also has that percentage there. And that percentage is relative to this recommendation of 2,300 milligrams per mm -hmm. day. And I'm going to tell you, you are going to be shocked. <laughs> and even healthy foods, even I've seen it. I just did it the other day. I was at a store. There's a very famous brand out there that is targeted for paleo eaters. I was like, oh, this looks fun. It's like a cauliflower rice stir fry. 50% mm -hmm. of the daily sodium in one serving, right? And this mm -hmm. is how they make foods stay shelf stable. And this is also how they make them taste good. And just as another quick example, I found this soup that I thought was great. It was like garden vegetable soup. I was adding kind of grilled chicken to it. I was like, quick, easy meal. You know me, hate to cook. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. I just flipped over the label to kind of look at the sodium. And I found out I was getting 100% of my sodium needs in that soup alone. Mm. And granted, it was supposed to be for two servings because it was two things in the soup thing and I ate them both. But I was just like, <laughs> holy cats. I mean, mm. I had no clue. You know, it's marketed as healthy, all of yeah. that stuff. And so I think people are going to be shocked when they start to do that. Let, let me ask you this before we, before we go, because this is really interesting to me. We've talked about this before. Most, if not all of my nutritional, I don't even want to call it knowledge, but my experience with paying attention to nutrition has come through CrossFit and through mm -hmm. my, you know, the last 10, 15 years of that. And I've never heard anybody talk about excess salt or excess sodium. It's always sugar. It's mm -hmm. always, that's the bad guy. That's the thing we've got to flip the label over on and, and pay attention to. Is that the case generally? Like people don't recognize that salt is also let's just call it this bad guy, It right alongside sugar? Is it that sugar is so much worse that we mm. like, let's focus on that and let's not worry about salt until, like, I'm just really curious about the, why sugar gets talked about all the time and yet salt almost never does. 
Yeah, I think there's a couple things there. The large one that I really want to hammer is these tend to travel together. <laughs> mm, yeah. If you were to cut down on your processed foods and cut down on sugar, I guarantee your salt will come down as well. So when you eat more whole on processed foods in the diet, generally sugar is low, generally salt is low. Yep. The other thing with the CrossFit population, so if we have these people who are cutting out sugar already, so they've already kind of lowered a bunch of it, and then their athletes, which I think we're going to get into a little bit, they might need a little bit higher salt. Maybe yep. not as much as they think, but they might need yep. a little bit higher salt. So I do think that generally a whole food-based diet for an athletic population, this won't be as big of a deal. But with kind of as I was getting to these healthy foods that are out there that are marketed to that population now that are just exploding, I think mm-hmm. sodium is going to be its own issue separate from sugar. Yeah. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I, I wanted, though, to keep I was kind of going on my story about my soup. I'll just kind of yes. continue it Sorry. for people. I didn't mean to interrupt your soup story. <laughs> Patrick, my soup story is just so soup interesting. <laughs> Don't cut off my soup story. But I think there's one kind of more thing because I threw out this metric that people could do. The other thing I wanted to mention for Anne or somebody else who at home can kind of assess this is that you can kind of see how much salt you're using based on that six gram amount. So remember I said 2,300 milligrams of sodium ends up being about six grams from your salt shaker. Perhaps, and that's about one teaspoon. So you can measure out about one teaspoon of your salt and put it like in a little bowl (laughs) and see how much you use of that per day. Now I'm assuming that you're probably eating something that comes out of a wrapper at some point, myself included. I have protein bars. Sometimes I have instant oatmeal or something like that. So you might end up only using kind of like a half of that teaspoon and then you're getting your other half of sodium. But this can kind of be a great way to check in on your overall sodium per day and kind of limit your use at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you mentioned, or you hinted at CrossFitters, athletes, folks who may be in a different category, different bucket than the average American. What about them? Do they need more sodium, more salt, anything, anything along those lines? Yeah. Maybe. (laughs) Mm. You know me, I refuse to answer. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Yeah, we do lose sodium and sweat, but we do have to remember that people tend to be higher in sodium. And so, you know, it kind of depends on how much you're sweating. And I would say that on average, you know, people I think listening to this podcast are maybe doing kind of that hour long CrossFit class or the hour, you know, group class or some sort of similar thing on their own, right? So I have a feeling they're already going to be covered quite well in their diet, that that they don't need this super high level of sodium, and they might be surprised to find how much sodium that they already have. Okay, so I will admit to you that sitting next to me is a drink, and <laughs> in that drink is some electrolyte mm. powder, or yeah. if that's the right way to put it. I'm rethinking that now, but I'm curious of what the science says about the value of that, if it's useful, if it's worthwhile, if we should be thinking about it, taking it, et cetera. Yeah, electrolyte drinks, for sure. Yeah, my general opinion is you don't need them. You don't need them. (laughs) I think they taste good, but you don't need it. Your diet should have the levels that most people need. And in case of sodium, again, you may be at an excessive level. Even even if you do do exercise, partially for the reason I mentioned that there's some of these healthy products out there that are low in sugar, but still quite high in sodium. Okay, so we do have to kind of understand sodium's relationship and this electrolyte thing. Sodium is an electrolyte. The three main electrolytes are sodium, potassium, and chloride. There are others. Those are the three biggies. Electrolyte means that these molecules can conduct a charge, and we actually do need this electrical charge present for a lot of different functions in the body, like your nervous system, slightly important, like your muscle function. (laughs) So we we do need these guys around. And all of these electrolyte drinks out there, they often contain a variety of things, but generally you're going to find some level of sodium potassium because those are kind of some of the biggies. Yep. And I do, I do see a bunch of recreational CrossFitters using them. And I, I, I'm just confused a little bit, right? Like you aren't sweating enough in a single CrossFit workout a day for this to be needed. Even on hot days, I'll see people on, you know, really, you know, these hundred scorcher plus days, mm-hmm. degree days. And people are like, ah, oh, drink your electrolytes. And I'm like, well, you probably have enough sodium already. And if you're eating fruits and veggies, you probably have enough potassium, right? So mm-hmm. why are we doing this? Now, I think there is an application, right? Truly endurance athletes, but this would be, you know, a different population, right? They we're looking at people that are sweating consistently for at least an hour. And this isn't like go for a neighborhood walk for an hour. This is sweating consistently for an hour or three hours, something like that. CrossFit games athletes. I saw one of them say recently that, you know, six hours of training a day, it's like the endurance version of CrossFit. Yes, you may in fact (laughs) Mm -hmm. need some electrolyte replenishment, but most people are nowhere close to that. You know, the recommendation for the general kind of baseline where to start 
or electrolyte replenishment is maybe 500 milligrams of sodium per every hour of sweating, hour of Mm -hmm. sweating, not 15 minutes within an hour of sweating, hour of sweating. (laughs) And for people that are truly endurance athletes and doing that kind of volume, I'm happy to recommend Alan Lim of Scratch Labs. He's got some A products that are great and B, he's just phenomenal in terms of nutrition. He knows his stuff. So check out his stuff. But I think for most people probably listening to this podcast, it's just misapplied precision to use that kind of terminology again. It's getting hyper worried about electrolyte intake you know, on hot days when we already are likely kind of in an excessive range, or maybe we should Mm. just improve our fruit and vegetable consumption. And, and I want to be clear, I'm saying this on average, right? Like I I bet there are some people listening to this podcast who are doing everything home prepped, are doing no processed foods. They are very active. They in fact might need to add some salt. And Mm. then there are some other people that I have a feeling probably have more salt than they even realize. And so this is where doing some self-observation with measurement is useful, not just sort of saying, well, I'm going to do the electrolyte drink and see how I feel. How about you actually figure out how much sodium you're doing on any given day or how much Mm -hmm. potassium, right? And then you can kind of figure out what you really need versus kind of these average guidelines. Do you think that part of the issue, at least in the athletic or fitness world, is that Gatorade, you know, in the 80s taught us or tried to teach us that we need you know, these electrolytes, no matter what, like that it's the secret bullet to, you know, whatever, getting better at football or running faster. Mm. Did we just kind of like collectively fall for convenient marketing? Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. I mean, you know, you have to remember that there's not a lot of money in fruits and vegetables. I mean, there's, you know, farmers aren't rich. (laughs) Farmers are not rich. So you have to make a product to sell what's in fruits and vegetables or, or whole food based protein sources. But I do also think it's just, you know, there are going to be athletes who need that for sure. A hundred percent. And I've never trained anybody who's at the NFL level playing football in, you know, Miami heat or something like that. Right. Like there's going to need people who need electrolyte replenishment. I just think it's a lot of people who are looking at these athletes for recommendations for their approach. And it's like, well, yeah. I don't think that you're training anywhere near their volume <laughs> or in those conditions to even start yeah. to think about it. Right. Yeah. One other question that pops in my mind is when I see friends or I've had friends try keto or, mm. or not try it, but actually kind of like that, that becomes what they do. Say something like, well, I, I've had to supplement with salt mm-hmm. for some reason that I don't fully understand. Is that if there is somebody out there listening and they're kind of consistently in ketosis, is their situation different enough that your advice would, would be different or no? No, there is. I mean, if they truly are doing keto, not keto one day, regular diet, the next three back to keto. But if they truly are doing keto and very stringent with it, yes. And it's just because the foods that you eat to be in ketosis end up such that your sodium intake is not high and your potassium intake is not high and that you may in fact end up supplementing with electrolytes. As -hmm. you know, I I don't tend to recommend that diet. So I kind of circumvent that problem with the recommendations. But yeah, that that is an issue. You had mentioned doing some self-analysis or some self-observation mm. about where each of us actually are totally as it relates to sodium intake. Would you only recommend, or maybe as a place to start, only measure, only pay attention to, like if you're doing a soup, like you had mentioned, or if you're something else, like you said, out of a box, out of a package, whatnot, yeah. or would you try to measure it across the full day alongside, okay, your 800 grams of fruit and veg, let's figure out what that is then also, or is it mostly just to get a sense of how much of this kind of processed or added sodium are we, you know, taking in? And then we can just assume that with the fruit and vegetables that that's okay. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends. One, you know, knowing what your blood pressure is right now is probably going to be a Mm. good indication. Now, of course, the younger you are, the more forgiving it will be. But yeah, I mean, if you already have a normal blood pressure and you're already active and you're not eating a ton of processed stuff, you might not need to do a ton of diet analysis. But I think a great place to start is just, quote, just with the sodium, only because I think people are going to be shocked. Like I said, I don't really know what what triggered me to flip over the soup that day, specifically looking for sodium. I was shocked, and then I've continued to do it since then and before I got this question. And I was also continued shocked, even on products that I didn't think were going to be very high. And so some mm-hmm. of it, I think, you know, continue to eat whole foods. I think you're going to be getting to the potassium level, kind of keep doing the 800 gram challenge. That's going to definitely help out your potassium. But I would definitely start with the sodium intake and try to get assessment of, am I anywhere near 2,300 milligrams per day? Yeah. Got it. 
Awesome. Anything else before we wrap up this conversation about sodium and blood pressure and hypertension and salt and electrolytes? Just to mention that the content that will be going up in the member site for this podcast mm. is in addition, we're going to talk about salt sensitivity. There does seem to be kind of some variation in how sensitive people are to salt. And so we're going to kind of dive into that. Awesome. So that's at members.optimizemenutrition.com. Yes? Yes. Thank you. All right, my friend. Thank you, EC. Thank you to everybody out there listening. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. If you know somebody who might like the show, please do share it with them. It helps. And we'll see everybody next time on the next episode of The Consistency Project. <laughs>